Okay, hi everybody. Um, I would like to start by reviewing what we did in the last presentation, uh, just by looking at this uh, definition of modern art. It's just taken from Wikipedia. Uh, now, modern art includes artistic work produced during the period extending roughly from the 1860s to the 1970s, and denotes the styles and philosophy of the art produced during that era. Now, the term is usually associated with art in which the traditions of the past have been thrown aside in a spirit of experimentation. Modern artists experimented with new ways of seeing and with fresh ideas about the nature of materials and the function of art. A tendency away from the narrative, which was characteristic for the traditional arts, toward abstraction. This is characteristic of much modern art. Now, more recent artistic production is often called contemporary art or postmodern art. So let's take a look again at the artists that we started with um, uh, at the beginning of the last presentation. I, I, want, to, I want to show you this um, just to give you a sense of you know, things don't just change overnight, okay? Uh, people are people, and to say that artists were not interested in self-expression before modern times uh, is probably not accurate, okay? They were interested in self-expression. It's just that the tradition they were working within um, hindered their ability to be self-expressive, okay? So Nicholas Poussin, uh, is he the first modern artist? Now, in this move towards self-expression, this emphasis on the subjective perspective of the artist, is this really new? Matthew Collings, in his book Matt's Old Masters, wrote, but I can think of an example of the self in old master art that really is arbitrary. Poussin's patron, who was later to become Pope Clement IX, gave Poussin the subject for the dance to the music of time. But Poussin gave it something that the Pope probably didn't ask for. He carefully pressed his thumb into every inch of the ground when it was still wet so that his thumbprint can be clearly seen throughout the paint surface, unrelated to anything else that's going on in the painting, either in the imagery or in the brushwork. Now, Poussin is considered the master of perfect order. Although we don't know if he was particularly well-educated, he's come to stand for reason and intellect and a thoughtful sublimation of the impulsive, arbitrary individual self. But here he is imposing something personal, his body's own imprint in such an oddly literal way that someone ought to be braying out an explanation of it that they've read in a press release from the Turner Prize. It has today's art culture's feeling, of official pointlessness and unhinged values. And here's, uh, here's uh, uh, some close-ups of the surface of the painting. Uh, this is the legs of the central figure. You can see uh, uh, prints A, B, and C. You can see it's all the same print over and over and over again, pressed into the surface of the painting. Um, now, the painting was, was cleaned in 19, well, in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, the assumption was that these fingerprints were in the upper layers or the varnish layers of the painting. And when they cleaned it and removed the varnish and replaced it with new varnish, they figured that these fingerprints would disappear. But they didn't, okay? And upon closer inspection, they revealed that they were in the ground, okay? And by the ground, we mean the gesso. It's basically, uh, you guys are using an acrylic-based gesso. Uh, this would have been a chalk-based uh, glue gesso. Uh, but it's the same thing. Uh, the, before he even began painting the painting, he had a white canvas covered in gesso, and before the gesso dried, he pressed his fingerprint into every little bit of it. Now, one last thing about Poussin. And, 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 and th that gesture, uh, pressing his fingerprint repeatedly into the surface of the canvas, it can only be read in one way. Poussin was basically just saying, I am Poussin, I am Poussin, I am Poussin. He... Um, the supposition there is that he resented being told what to do. He wanted his painting to reflect him, okay? Now, one last thing about Poussin. To put this into perspective as an incident that's not necessarily isolated in his work, this is from the essay about painting by Dennis Young, who teaches at, uh, at NASCAD. He says that Poussin can be thought of as the first modern artist. It is not until Poussin, in the mid-17th century, that we find a painter claiming that the aim of visual art is delectation, delight, enjoyment, or pleasure. This is a statement that, surprisingly, is regarded as revolutionary. 
And this is Jacques Louis David. We looked at his portrait of Napoleon last time. Um, this is called The Death of Marat from 1793. Now, David was a supporter of the revolutionary leader Marat. The painting shows the radical journalist Marat lying dead in his bath on July 13, 1793, after his mur murder by Charlotte Corday. This was painted shortly after the murder, and it's been described as the first modernist painting because of the way it took the subject of politics as its material and did not transmute it. Okay? So while David was operating very much within a tradition of painting, here he's directly expressing his own political ideas. He's not wryly concealing them in allegory. He's not, you know, it, it, he's being straightforward and direct rather than simply acting in the service of authority and painting what he's told to paint. He's, he's expressing how he feels, okay? In the 20th century, this painting inspired several painters, among them Picasso and Edvard Munch. Edvard Munch painted The Scream. We looked at that painting in the first presentation. Uh, each of these artists made their own versions of this painting. So, so even during their time, this painting was regarded as being quite modern, okay? This is... Uh, Vincent van Gogh's The Potato Eaters, 1885. And we talked earlier about uh, the introduction of, of, uh, of everyday subject matter in painting as, as a, modern, you know, a, a modern advancement. Okay? This early canvas is considered van Gogh's first masterpiece. Uh, the real innovation here is van Gogh's depiction, or his, I'm sorry, his decision to depict the people and their lives truthfully. He depicts the scene in a dull palette. Okay, which echoes the drab living conditions of the peasants, and he used ugly models to communicate the effects that manual labor had upon these workers. Life was hard, and these people, they look like they've lived a hard life. The most important thing there is that he depicts the scene truthfully, the way they lived. Okay, so it's very similar to uh, to uh, the, the 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 what's considered to be a modern innovation in the work of David, depicting his political. Uh, uh, ideas truthfully. The artist's subjective experience now becomes the subject. Okay, so Van Gogh described this painting in a letter to his sister. He wrote, Here you have a night painting without black, with nothing but beautiful blue and violet and green, and in this surrounding, the illuminated area colors itself sulfur pale yellow and citron green. It amuses me enormously to paint the night right on the spot. So this was painted on the street at night. Van Gogh recreated the setting directly from his observations. So this is a practice he inherited from the Impressionists, uh, Monet's Haystacks, right? So he's painting on the spot like the Impressionists, but he didn't record the scene exactly as he saw it, which is, that was Monet's approach. Monet was giving you an impression of the scene, uh, an impression of the of, of the how the scene looks. Okay, instead, Van Gogh is communicating a spiritual and a psychological tone that's based on his individual and personal reaction. So, as a viewer, you get a clear sense of the excitement and pleasure that Van Gogh felt while painting the work. So, while Monet is is giving you an impression of how the thing looks in terms of what it's like to be there, Van Gogh is giving you an an impression of how it feels to be there. Here, color is to do everything. Van Gogh wrote this to his brother Theo about this painting. This is uh, The Bedroom, 1889. This time, it's just simply my bedroom. Only here, color is to do everything, and giving by its simplification a grander style to things, Color is to be suggestive here of rest or of sleep in general. In, in a word, looking at this picture ought to rest the brain or rather the imagination. So again, he's, he's, he's trying to communicate what it feels like to be in the bedroom. And this is Starry Night from 1889. Okay, um, very famous painting. Starry Night is often considered Van Gogh's most important painting. Unlike most of his landscapes, this was painted in the studio. It was painted from his imagination, and it represents a radical departure from his previous, more naturalistic landscapes. Now, the sky is abstracted, rendered through tumultuous curves and lines, the chaos of nature subverted by a rigorous formal arrangement. So, you can see this painting as being representational of the artist's interior emotional life. And because of this, Starry Night is regarded as a major advancement in painting. It's not so much a representation of the physical world as even the bedroom and the cafe at Arles is. 
It's a representation of Van Gogh's state of mind. This was a time of, uh, of war and social upheaval. Okay, the artists of the early 20th century have broken with tradition. They did away with the academic structure that characterized the art of the past, and they embraced experimentation, and they questioned everything. It was a time of upheaval in many ways. Socially, the nature of work was changing with factories, the invention of machines, the First World War restructured the map of Europe, there was the rise of authoritarianism and fascism, and a number of regional military conflicts between the two world wars. And the ideas that emerged from the new art began to spread across the Atlantic to the United States. So we're talking about how, how, uh, how paintings can depict uh, the, the, the way the artist feels and generate those feelings in the viewer. Um, Picasso's war was uh, the Spanish Civil War. And this is one of his best known works, Guernica, okay, from 1937. It's regarded by many as one of the most moving and powerful anti-war paintings in history. I've just thrown in a few, a few more um, uh, images of, of uh, other artists who are working around this time, just to give you a sense of what's going on on the, on the periphery. Uh, we talked about how uh, photography changed um, the way artists looked at cropping their pictures, okay? Um, this is a good example of that. This, this painting is cropped very much like a photograph, and it does give you the, the, the sense of intimacy. Uh, you almost feel as though you're sitting in the boat you know, with these people behind the man who's rowing. Um, Mary Cassatt was born in America, uh, but she spent most of her adult life in Paris. Now, she's, she's quite remarkable in that um, um, all she wanted to do was be a modern artist. At about 15, I think she left, uh, left America and went to Paris, and she achieved her goal. And this was at a time when, uh, when uh, uh, you know, women weren't taken seriously, uh, but she was taken very seriously, both by her artist peers and by critics. This is George Seurat. Now, Seurat is important uh, in terms of um, Impressionism's uh, move to, uh, to uh, uh, let's say, analytically explore how we see. Okay, Seurat was a post-Impressionist artist, and he's best known for devising the painting technique known as pointillism. Uh, this is a Sunday on Le Grand Jatte uh, from 1884, and this painting is made up of, and all of his paintings at this time were made up of thousands of tiny dots of color. And uh, and the reason he did this was he he was exploring how your eye actually works. If you look at this tree uh, close up, you'll see it's made from hundreds and hundreds of little dots of brown and blue and yellow. And it, when you stand back, um, it appears green. Uh, because it, what it's called is optical mixing. And so instead of mixing the paint on the canvas, he's, uh, uh, he's allowing the paint to be mixed by the viewer, essentially. Your eye does the mixing. This is Paul Klee. He's a Swiss-born artist, uh, influenced by both Cubism and Surrealism. He's an influential artist. I put this in to give you an idea. When I say that these, the, you know, the, the ideas are spreading, uh, throughout Europe, uh, throughout the Western world. Um, but the artists who are receiving these ideas and exploring them uh, are free to, to mix them up, let's say. Um, in this painting, for instance, Black Columns in a Landscape in 1919, you can absolutely see uh, the influence of Cubism with the fragmented subject matter as though you're seeing it from many different angles at the same time. Uh, but uh, he was actually uh, uh, in, involved in the Surrealist movement, and the subject of the painting is uh, a kind of a dream landscape. Talking about Surrealists, here's uh, Jean Miro. Um, he's widely considered one of the leading Surrealists. Now, Miro is best known for his development of a style of free-form automatism. Okay, It's a kind of random drawing that attempted to express the inner workings of the subconscious. Now, when I say random drawing, just imagine that you're on the telephone talking to a friend and you've got a pencil in your hand and pad of paper. The kind of drawing or doodling that you would do, uh, the, the kind of half-conscious doodling that you would do while you're focusing on something else, your conversation with your friend, that's what he's trying to, to, uh, to incorporate into this painting. And Miro used color and form symbolically 
abandoning typical painting subjects and combining these abstract elements with recurring motifs like birds, eyes, and the moon. He said, he said uh, I try to apply colors like words that shape poems or like notes that shape music. So these artists were, you know, they were, they were uh, um, uh, 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 looking at ideas uh, from that were that were being you know used in other mediums, other art forms like poetry, like music, and they were trying to incorporate these ideas in paintings. So the ideas were they were crossing boundaries. From Paris to New York. Um, now, because of the political upheavals we've been talking about and war in Europe, it wasn't just the ideas that were that were you know uh, uh, expanding out from Europe that were moving across the Atlantic. Uh, the artists themselves were coming to America, and they all landed in New York City. They were fleeing persecution by the fascists, and they were escaping this increasingly tumultuous political conditions uh, that they had encountered in Europe. Um, now, within a period of 10 or 20 years, New York was going to re replace Paris as the, uh, as the center of the art world. This is an early painting by Mark Rothko. Mark Rothko in the 1930s in America. Now, Rothko was an immigrant. He was born in Russia. His father feared that his sons would be drafted into the Imperial Russian Army, and so the family immigrated to America. While visiting a friend at the Art Students League of New York, he saw students sketching a model. Now, according to Rothko, this was the moment when he decided to devote himself to art. In the mid-1930s, Mark Rothko began a series of works basing, base, based on his experience of, uh, of New York City. They became known as the Subway Series. So it's, a, it's hard to imagine a more, a more New York uh, uh, subject than people waiting for a train on a subway platform. Mark Rothko's subway paintings were made long before he developed what was going to become his mature and unmistakable style. The first of, uh, of his famous color field paintings, uh, they won't be made for another 10 years, but the paintings from the series Scenes in the Subway with their simple horizontal and vertical geometry and their juxtapositions of areas of flat, vibrant color provide us with some indication of what is to come. And this, this is what is to come, okay? Um, this is called Yellow Cherry and Orange from 1947. There are no hard lines or clear divisions of shape in his later abstract paintings. You can see they're entirely abstracted. They're similar to the subway paintings in, in their organization, but all the detail and all the references to reality are gone. Okay. Now, the boundaries between the multiforms or color fields, uh, initially I think they were called multiforms, for which he's well, uh, most well known, are fuzzy, allowing the colors to softly blend into each other, calling to mind the way smoke gently fills an empty room. So it's, it's untitled, it's referred to as a multiform from 1948. In 47, Rothko wrote about his work and he described his paintings as dramas. Okay, he said that he felt it was no longer appropriate for post-war artists to use figurative subject matter to convey emotions and experiences. With us, the disguise must be complete, he wrote. The familiar identity of things has to be pulverized in order to destroy the finite associations with which our society increasingly enshrouds every aspect of our environment. So he saw his work as fulfilling an eternally familiar need for a kind of spiritual resolution with existence. He felt like any association with the familiar identity of things would make this impossible, which leads him, of course, to abstraction. So by the end of the 1940s, this is untitled, this is from 1951. So by the end of the 1940s, following years of experimentation, Mark Rothko's paintings became completely abstract and his signature style emerged, okay? The style that emerged is two or three rectangles set on a background that both divides them from one another while consolidating them into a unified composition, okay? Again, the edges of Rothko's forms are never distinct, like smoke filling a room, which allows the eye to move effortlessly from one area of color uh, to the next. This is number nine, dark 
over light, earth violet and yellow in rose from 1954. That's a, the, the title is quite a mouthful. Uh, so fortunately, this painting has a, uh, has a nickname, and the nickname for the painting is Close Up of Bumblebee. It's about seven feet high, about six feet wide. And viewing this painting in person, the black pops out against the yellow, and the colors seem to, seem to vibrate. This is orange and yellow from 1956. Okay, so Rothko seemed to feel that physical brushwork would get in the way, so he tried to remove all evidence of the creation process. Now, to accomplish this, he applied numerous layers of very thin down paint with a, a brush or a rag to the surfaces, which absorbed the colors into the fibers of the canvas. Okay, so the many thin washes of color helped to give his paintings a brightness and an intensity as if they're glowing from within. He was very focused on creating a visual situation that would encourage thoughtful contemplation. Okay, that was, that was his aim here. Um, Orange and yellow was considered quite large in the 1950s, and Rothko asked viewers to stand very close so the painting would occupy their entire visual field. When I say close, he, he, actually, he actually said he wanted people to stand like one foot away. So as you're looking at the painting, you become enveloped in, in the color. Now the color started to recede uh, as, uh, as time went on. This is un untitled, 1960. In Untitled 1960, Rothko uses a, a subdued color palette of deep burgundy, warm blush, royal blue, black gray, and ephemeral cloud white, moving away from his characteristic bright colors in the 1950s. Now, he was a troubled guy, and he did struggle with depression, and as the years went by, we do see his paintings becoming darker and gloomier, um, and, uh, and while well, it's possible to just see it as, uh, as uh, uh, let's see, as, a, as, as though the paintings are becoming more sophisticated and more subtle. Um, it's also possible to see them as being representative of his increasingly darkening uh, state of mind. Here, here he is. This is Rothko in his studio, 1960. Um, Rothko believed that painting was a powerful form of communication. The fact that a lot of people break down and cry when confronted with my picture shows that I can communicate those basic human emotions, he said in an interview in 1956. Now, the people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience that I had when I painted them. So he, he felt it was possible to create a profound connection between artist and canvas and viewer. Now, he asserted that his works were not only, that they not only expressed human emotion, but also stimulated psychological and emotional experiences in those who witnessed them. Many viewers do describe having strong emotional reactions to his paintings, some of them indeed reporting that they've been brought to tears. Painting is not about an experience, he told Life magazine in 1959, okay? It, is an experience. Now, that's, that's a very important statement. Okay? It's similar to Van Gogh uh, with Starry Night, you know, suggesting uh, that, uh, that the viewer, um, that it's possible for the viewer to have an experience that the same, that's the same as he's having. Um, it, it, it's, it's important, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's, although, although it had been repeated many times over the years, uh, with Rothko in particular, it's, it's particularly significant. Mark Rothko's hovering rectangles of color suspended within monochromatic fields are among the most recognizable paintings produced in the 20th century. Now, they may appear simple, but they are undeniably powerful. Rothko was a, considered an abstract expressionist. Now, abstract expressionism, or the New York School, um, the artists of this movement were mostly based in New York City. Okay, now the name evokes their aim to make art that, while abstract, was also expressive or emotional in its effect. They were inspired by the surrealist idea that art should be a spontaneous, automatic, or subconscious creation, that it should come from the unconscious mind, and this idea was in part inspired by the automatism of artist uh, Jean Miro. 
Now, Rothko was one of the most important abstract expressionist artists. His work was championed by the famous art critic Clement Greenberg, along with Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning. Okay, you know, while the paintings of these three artists were very different in style, what they were trying to accomplish in their paintings can be seen as being quite similar. This is Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg. Greenberg uh, promoted formalism. He felt that it was pointless to speculate about the content of paintings. Okay, what the painting was about didn't matter. Instead, we should focus on formal elements like shape and color and line and composition to determine the quality of painting or even to compare a painting with, uh, with paintings from the past, let's say. Rosenberg, he coined the term action painting. He suggested that we should stop thinking of the canvas as a surface on which to paint a picture, but instead as an arena in which to act, to record an event or an action. Okay. Now, Jackson Pollock. Now within abstract expressionism, there were two broad groupings. Okay. There were color field painters like Mark Rothko, his contemporaries, uh, artists like, you know, like Barnett Newman or Clifford Still. Um, all those guys were deeply interested in myth and spirituality, okay? And they made simple paintings with large areas of color intended to produce a contemplative or a meditational response in the viewer. And then there were action painters, okay? They worked spontaneously, often with large brushes making sweeping gestural marks. Um, Franz Klein was an action painter. Jackson Pollock was most certainly an action painter. Uh, here is, uh, talk about artists becoming celebrities. Here's Jackson Pollock in Life magazine in 1949. And the question being asked here is, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? Well, he certainly was awesome. And uh, it's undeniable that he, he, he was certainly one of the most influential painters in the United States. This is Autumn Rhythm, number 30 from 1950. Uh, it's a very large painting, a very simple painting, involving spontaneity and improvisation, okay? So here's a photograph of Pollock in his studio working on one of his revolutionary drip paintings. Instead of using an easel, he worked on a canvas that was tacked to the floor of his barn studio. Rather than using brushes, he used sticks to flip and drip and to spatter the paint. And the sticks were usually just worn out brushes. He wore them down to a nub and then they were basically just sticks. Or he poured the paint straight from the can. He used household enamels, regular house paint, instead of traditional oils. Now there's a, there's a distinct lyrical quality to these paintings. They're impulsive, they're performative. Remember, an arena in which to act action painting. Uh, these are performative. He would move all around the, the canvas, working from all four sides, just scampering around, splattering paint on the canvas. Um, these paintings invite comparisons to the most influential music of the time, jazz, with its emphasis on improvisation, or to Jack Kerouac's work of benzedrine-fueled spontaneous prose, On the Road, which he claimed was written in a three-week frenzy on a continuous 120-foot scroll of tracing paper. So again, the ideas that are informing these art movements in all the different mediums, from, from music to literature to dance uh, to, uh, to painting, um, they're, 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 they're crossing, crossing boundaries. The, idea are, the ideas are crossing boundaries. Here's the painting. I believe this is uh, the Metropolitan Museum. It might be the Museum of Modern Art. Regardless, this is in New York City. So you can see it's quite a large painting. I am nature. Now the story goes that uh, the painter Hans Hoffman visited Pollock's studio and he asked, do you work from nature? And Pollock responded, I am nature. Now Pollock's wife the painter Lee Krasner noted that this statement articulates an important difference between the European, mostly French painters of the early 20th century and then what followed in America. It's very similar to Rothko's assertion that painting is not about an experience. It is an experience or it, you know, it's capable of generating an experience in the viewer. 
Um, and he's talking about nature. And, you know, there's many ways to think of these paintings as being uh, 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 actual, actual uh, manifestations of nature. You can think of them as being uh, uh, representational of his, uh, of his chaotic thought processes, of the energy, of the, of the performance of making the painting. You could think of them as, they almost read as fractals. Think about lying on the ground, looking up through tree branches and, and leaves at the, at the sky beyond. These paintings are are like nature in that way. In that the like they're they what they what they certainly do reflect is the complexity of nature, um, in their randomness. Right, uh, I like to think of them as being representational of the forces of nature. If you think about a human being as being um, uh, inseparable from nature, we all we all are are subject to to uh, to the laws of physics. Right. This painting um, uh, is, is, he said he said he was controlling the way he made these paintings, that he had control over them, but he was certainly embracing chance. Uh, he was as much as as much as he was uh, was uh, directing the paint what to do. The paint certainly was going to do what it was going to do anyway. The viscosity of the paint. Uh, speaking about the forces of nature, you know the the paint's relationship with gravity. All of that is uh, is evident uh, in these paintings. So, while they're very simple, like the Rothko paintings, there it's possible to think of them in many different, very complex ways. Well, this is Willem de Kooning. Okay, Willem de Kooning was born in Rotterdam, moved to America in 1926. Well, he was un undoubtedly uh, one of the most influential artists of the Abstract Expressionist movement. He most often worked from observable reality, um, primarily figures and landscapes. So where Pollock said, I don't work from nature, I am nature. Uh, de Kooning very much worked from nature. Even excavation, this, this, this painting, it's one of his most purely abstract paintings features hooked calligraphic lines that suggest body parts, fish and bird shapes, human noses, eyes, teeth, necks, and jaws. This is excavation from 1950, okay? <laughs> then we get here. This is, uh, this is Woman 1, um, 1950 to 1952, again, suggesting he worked on this painting for two years. And he did, uh... Famously, his process involved him never being satisfied with anything he ever did, or uh, the painting was always done whenever he was just done with it, whenever he, he lo lo lost interest or decided to move on, because he would just paint and repaint and repaint and repaint these services um, until, until they were either right or until he was, like I said, uh, just finished. When de Kooning painted Woman One, um, abstraction, as we've observed, was dominant in American art. Now, artists and critics had declared the human figure to be an obsolete subject, and de Kooning himself was known for the abstract compositions that he had been producing over the previous years, like, like uh, excavation. And de Kooning didn't, he didn't care. De Kooning just didn't care what anybody said. He said flesh was the reason that oil paint was invented, he famously declared. And while many of his art world colleagues saw this painting, or these paintings, as a betrayal, others accused him straight out of misogyny. So they suggested that his depiction of the female form in these paintings was objectifying and violent. He didn't see them that way. His response was that beauty becomes petulant to me. He said, I like the grotesque. It's more joyous. <laughs> so he saw these paintings as, as joyous paintings. Here's another one. This is called Woman on a Bicycle, Woman and Bicycle, 1952 to 1953. Abstraction, representation, does it even matter? Now the critic uh, Clement Greenberg, again, came to de Kooning's defense, reassuring his detractors that the woman paintings were among the most advanced in our time. Greenberg, again, remember, didn't care what, what it was a painting of. He cared about how it was painted. He was a formalist looking at line, color, design, uh, you know, composition, uh, the, 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 the quality of the brushwork and the color. Um, but it's not clear that de Kooning really needed defending. Okay, his status as one of the most admired artists of the time was quite secure. What is clear 
is that Willem de Kooning never believed that abstraction and representation were mutually exclusive. As he stated, I'm not interested in abstracting or taking things out or reducing painting to design or form or line or color. I paint this way because I can keep putting more things in it. Drama, anger, pain, love, a figure, a horse, my ideas about space. Through your eyes, it again becomes an emotion or an idea. So there you have it. Uh, de Kooning, again, is saying uh, almost the same thing that... Uh, that Van Gogh had said 55 years earlier that uh, he's painting, he's making his paintings. And in the case of, uh, of de Kooning, he's making them intuitively. They're based on his feelings and, you know, which is whatever comes to him in the moment, right? They're very impulsive, very intuitive. Um, but uh, what, what, he's, what he's suggesting is happening with the viewer is that there's indeed an emotional response that's going to be created through these paintings in the viewer themselves. And that's that's the viewer's response. It's not necessarily the same as his. Okay. Um, well, that does it for, uh, for f the feelings component. Um, I guess I'll see you next week. We'll wrap it up here, and uh, I'll see you next week, and we'll talk about... Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make a distinction between feelings and ideas. Okay. So I'll see you next week.